Uh, maybe it's because we're so aware, aware that our teams are so often uh, composed of volunteers that if we're not kind and if we try to address these elephants, the volunteer will just go, well, I was volunteering my time anyway, so I'll just go. I know that that's certainly been a fear of mine. And look, I want to be real. I have not been very good at addressing elephants in the room in my leadership for all of the reasons I've just said and more. Um, I uh, am ready to kick off our second last leadership uh, talk right now. So we have been looking at the principles of emotionally healthy leadership by Peter Scazzaro and his challenge for us to, first of all, grow our roots down into Christ before we start trying to lead out of uh, um, roots that are shallow. We want to lead out of roots that are deep. And so for the last five weeks, we've been looking at all things in our roots, right? The superpower of stillness, the secret of success, which is doing the will of God, leaning into your limits, uh, the examination, fascination and inspirational indifference, which is praying to be indifferent to all except the will of God as we go about our day. But today and next week, we're kicking into uh, those leadership qualities that are external, those things that we do with our teams and the people um, that we lead. And today's talk is called Empowering Your Elephants. Hey, in that email I sent out, I had that song lyric that I put in there. Does anyone know that song? Hands up if you know that song. I'm not seeing any hands. That's all right. It was a play school song when I was younger. It goes, five little elephants balancing. Anyway, it's okay if you don't know it, but that's where I got it from. I think Denise knows it. I'm seeing her nodding. Well, today we're talking about elephants in the room as we talk about empowering your elephants. I'm sure you've heard of this phrase, elephants in the room. There's an elephant in the room. Uh, when someone says that, that means that there's something not quite up to standard that's going on. And it's obvious to everybody, but no one is talking about it. So addressing the elephants in the room are one of the key jobs as us as leaders, because when we address elephants in the room, what we're actually doing is we're not so much telling somebody something that something is wrong. We're saying, hey, this is the culture. This is the way we do things around here. And we need to bring this back underneath that culture, because as leaders, we're called to lead the culture. Now, if you're a team leader, some of these elephants in the room might look like somebody always turning up late somebody having a poor attitude, somebody who never responds to their pulse requests, uh, somebody who's not being reliable, not turning up when they say they'd be there, somebody who's not following procedure, maybe somebody who's not dressed properly. You know, on platform team, we have a certain standard. You know, you've got to wear enclosed shoes for safety. You've got to make sure that your shoulders are covered, things like that. Uh, but also in life group, there are often elephants in the room, aren't there? If you're a life group leader, maybe it's somebody who's always over monopolizing the conversation. Maybe it's somebody who makes jokes that might be rude or sexist or racist or inappropriate in some way. Maybe there's somebody who's always oversharing in a way that um, maybe doesn't feel appropriate or safe. Maybe there's somebody who's being overly, overly insensitive or overly assertive. There might even be a fight between members of the group. Someone's not turning up this week because someone else said something, right? Could be gossiping within the group. Those are the two examples I've chosen just now, being a team leader or being a life group leader. But no matter what group we're leading, there are often elephants that can rear their heads. But so often, right, as leaders, we can leave these elephants unaddressed. Maybe we don't want to hurt people's feelings. Maybe we're just no good at conflict resolution. Maybe we just don't know what to do. Maybe because we want to be that loving and kind member of the church, we just think it's better just to let it go. Uh, maybe it's because we're so aware, aware that our teams are so often uh, composed of volunteers that if we're not kind and if we try to address these elephants, the volunteer will just go, well, I was volunteering my time anyway, so I'll just go. I know that that's certainly been a fear of mine. And look, I want to be real. I have not been very good at addressing elephants in the room in my leadership for all of the reasons I've just said and more. But if I'm going to be honest about it, the number one reason I'm not good at addressing elephants in the room is because I like being liked. I wonder if anyone else can relate to that, liking being liked. But in reading Scazzaro's book, what I became very convicted about was the importance of empowering my elephants, not ignoring them because it's actually never kind to be unclear and to leave things 
unaddressed. And if I want to be a kind person, I actually have to get better at addressing and empowering my elephants. Uh, it's actually not good to ignore our elephants because being more concerned about being liked has nothing to do with loving the other person. It's actually got more to do with me loving myself. And if being kind always means agreeing with everyone and never helping them to grow, then it's not kindness at all. We're actually encouraging blindness. So in churches where elephants are not addressed, people don't usually feel safe. People don't grow. And people are robbed of the opportunity to become all that they can be because if in love someone would take them aside and in love address that elephant, that they would be empowered to grow. And isn't that what churches should be about? Yes, to be a place of loving kindness, but loving kindness that enables people to grow. So I myself have been an encouraged elephant, right? There's been things that I've done that have been in my blind spot that I haven't realized. And somebody out of loving kindness has said, okay, let's address this. And it wasn't comfortable, but because somebody had that loving conversation with me, I was then able to grow. I'd love to just read to you a part of Schizero's book, which really convicted me on this point, right? That being overly kind was actually letting down, I said being overly kind because it's not really kind, but prioritising what looks like kindness was actually letting down the people that I lead. So on page 228, Schizero says this, if we lead in the church or in the not-profit sector, we may not be able to pay, pay marketplace salaries. In fact, most of the team we lead might be comprised of volunteers, but we can actually offer something much more valuable, personal spiritual development to help those we lead to become more like Jesus. And that is quite a gift. Now, I would say that is actually the greatest gift that we can offer. And even though people are only volunteers on our team, even when they go to their pl places of paid employment, don't we know that sometimes workplaces can have terrible culture with all the elephants going unaddressed because um, it, no one is going above and beyond to try and create a loving environment. And so here at the church, as leaders who really want to love those people that we lead, we can actually offer the greatest gift they could possibly ever get, the opportunity to actually really grow. So I don't know about you, but I know that I want that kind of culture in our churches, the place where people aren't just left to um, do whatever for the rest of their lives with nobody ever holding up a mirror to their blind spots. I want to get to heaven and know that because I was willing to have the perhaps uncomfortable conversation, but in love, that people will get the tools and the information they need in order to grow so that they will then be able to impact others. And so by the time we get to heaven, because we were willing to have one hopefully more than one, but one uncomfortable conversation, it might be that there's untold fruit from that conversation that echoes down the generations, right? Empowering our elephants is so much more than about that one moment of being uncomfortable. As leaders, we can bring something huge in terms of growth. So I wonder, as I've been speaking, if there might be any elephants in your world, in your rooms, in your leadership spaces that may have popped to mind. I know that I've got a few that I'm actively trying to think about and pray about how am I going to address these next. Now, there's all kinds of ways to do this, but uh, in this last bit of my leadership talk, I'd just like to give you two of the tools that Schizero gives us to get us started, right? There's the first tool, which is called the I'm puzzled tool. And the second tool, which is called compliments with recommendations, right? So let's start with the first one, the I'm puzzled tool. Let's just say you've turned up to uh, your team to lead it and somebody's come in quite late, right? And they always come up. They always come up late. We've never addressed it before, but we've decided not today I'm going to address this, right? How do we do it? Well, the I'm puzzled tool puts you in a curious mindset to encourage an elephant. We're not going to assume that we actually know why this person is always turning up late. We're going to come with a curious mindset to find out why a particular thing might be happening. And that sets us up automatically to address this in a more loving way. Yeah, I would love to give you this example from the book from page 226. Scazzera says, being puzzled enables us to avoid assumptions and negative interpretations. For example, instead of saying, why did you leave such a mess in our office kitchen? We can say, I'm puzzled about why you didn't clean up after yourself. 
Instead of saying, you should have returned my email sooner, we say, I'm puzzled why you didn't respond to my email sooner. Making an I'm puzzled statement forces us to acknowledge that we actually don't know the why. It helps us to pause and catch our hearts before it ju jumps to a judgment. And I would just say it helps just to start the conversation. So in this case, somebody's always turning up to a team meeting late. You find a private moment, you address it quickly. You say, hey, I'm puzzled as to why you came late today. Like you actually come, as you don't be accusing, I'm puzzled as to why you came late today. I noticed that it was five minutes late. Just let them talk. And then once they finish talking, you might be able to say, hey, cool, it's really important that we all arrive on time. Would it be okay if next time you prioritize trying to get here at whatever time it is? And it's done. So the unpuzzle tool. The other tool that Schizero brings up is this one. It's called the Complaints with Recommendations tool. And I'll just read again from this book. It says, we also teach our team and members of the church how to make healthy complaints in our culture in the new family of Jesus. To unlearn negative gen generational patterns from their family of origin, we encourage people to use the phrase, I notice and I prefer as the formula for making a complaint. For example, when a supervisor sends a PowerPoint presentation to the tech volunteer at the last minute, instead of stuffing uh, frustration and annoyance, sorry, instead of frustration and annoyance, he might say, I noticed that you sent me your PowerPoint two hours before your presentation. I would prefer it if you could send it one day ahead of time so I have time to upload it into our computer system. Or instead of saying, you are late for our meeting, if you don't turn up, turn up on time, I can't work with you in the future, we might say, I noticed you arrived 20 minutes late for our leadership team meeting, and I prefer that you call when you are running late so that I can adjust my schedule. It's a simple phrase, but saying I notice and I prefer effectively gives people training wheels to relate differently. It helps them to be aware of and take responsibility for the small irritations and annoyances that arise every day. Now, I don't know about you. Maybe you're fantastic at conflict resolution. I'm not. And so I love these tools, the I'm puzzled and the complaints with recommendations, I notice and I prefer. And I'm already starting to try and use that in my everyday. But I know that sometimes there are elephants that can't be addressed with either of these tools. Sometimes it has to, it needs to be a pastoral care conversation. It might be a, hey, can we go out for a coffee? And can I talk to you about something from a pastoral perspective? It's up to us to find out the right way to address these elephants, but they are certainly worth encouraging. Now, just before I finish, I just want to say that, of course, I know that Jesus said to worry about the plank in your own eye before you go ahead and start pointing out the specks in somebody else's eye. And that is absolutely true. And I think sometimes as leaders that can make us fall silent on our elephants. I think it's so important that as we do encourage our elephants, we make sure that our hearts are in the right place, that we are humble and as much as possible that our own actions are above reproach that we're willing to work on our own elephanty habits. We might also need to make sure that we're not heading out and correcting everyone left, right and centre all the time and being a micromanager, right? We don't want to let the pendulum swing to the other side. And we have to acknowledge that we can only lead people to the level of permission that they've given us. But if somebody is on your team, if somebody is in your life group, then you have permission to empower those elephants because you are the leader and the culture of that group and that team is ultimately up to you. Ah, and of course, as I've said a few times, it's always something that we need to do in love. The faster these things are addressed, the better, um, but we should never do it angry. We should never do it rushed, never in public and never without prayer to make sure our hearts are in the right place. Last week, we talked about praying that prayer of indifference right? And so depending on how big the elephant is, we might need to take a certain chunk of our day to really pray that prayer of an indifferent heart to all but what the Holy Spirit would have us do before we approach that situation. And as we work on our own spiritual journey, the most important thing we can bring as leaders, which is our love for others, should always be growing to such a point that we're not going to be leaving a string of elephants balancing behind us, right? As leaders, it's always great to know that we're not leaving four little elephants balancing on that string as we try to march ahead, that we turn around and we say, all right, let's clear this piece of string. No elephants balancing, right? We want to encourage them to the point where they can fly off and be free and uh, our leadership can be more free. And we know that we've planted the seeds to create perhaps even generational change as we've been uh, brave 
to empower these elephants and um, create a better culture for our team.